go. Okay, so in this session, I'm going to try and make a really simple platformer game. So we're going to use some of the stuff we've learned in previous sessions. Um, I think I'm going to go on the internet and steal some sprites to use for a character, and then we're going to use some physics to give them a character controller. We're going to add some platforms in the game. So also building on last time when we were talking about the physics components, there are other physics components we didn't look at that are going to be really useful for platformers. Um, and we'll probably work on some enemies and kind of add some of those. Um, I will be winging the entire session, so we're just going to see what we end up with at the end here. Um, so has everyone got Unity open? I know Unity's haven't crashed yet, I hope. <laughs> um, okay, if I've gotten almost, then I probably will crack on. Um, I think the first thing I'm going to do, uh, which we haven't done yet, if I go into my Assets Scenes folder, you'll see that we already have a sample scene, and that's what we've been working on this entire time. When you create a Unity project, it just creates a scene for you. Um, I don't know if I've made this explicit, but a scene is basically a level, so it's a collection of objects that you put in a level, basically. And when we're playing games, we can load other scenes, and that's basically like transitioning to another level or you can add scenes together. So some people like to have parts of one level in a scene and another part in another scene, and you can do fancy stuff like loading other scenes alongside other scenes. But we're not going to do anything special like that. We're just going to have normal levels in scenes. The first thing I'm going to do is create a new scene. So we'll work basically from scratch. So I'll go right click, create somewhere here, scene. And I'm just going to call this uh, basic Level. Basic level, that will do. I didn't even capitalize that correctly. Um, there we go. And I'll double click to open that up. And we should have the basic Unity scene again. So it will just have a main camera pointing at nothing. Um, I'm just going to press F to frame select that. So if you've selected an object and you press F, then it will zoom in on the object and put that center screen. Um, so yeah, we'll have a blank scene, and we want to make a platformer. So what goes in a platformer? There's a character, there's platforms, and there's normally some kind of end to the level, and probably some enemies. So I am going to very quickly just add a simple platform to start off with. I'll just add a square. I'll put this down at the bottom. So if you didn't catch that, I went to game objects, 2D object, sprites, square. Now it's just going to add a square sprite. I'm going to go to Add Component. And I'm going to search for a Box Collider 2D. And if you didn't catch last week's session, colliders are basically a physics component that adds a bounding box around an object, and it stops things from phasing through this object. Um, I'm just going to scale this a little bit along the X, so it's going to be 10 across. And that's going to be our starting platform. Um, now we're going to start thinking about the character. So that's the first thing I'm going to make. Um, and for this, I'm going to go on the internet and I'm going to find some sprites for the character. So if you don't have an artist on your team, there's plenty of places you can go online to go get sprites just to test out your prototypes. And one of my favorite creators of this is called Kenny. Uh, so it's spelled K-E-N-N-E-Y. And Kenny makes loads of free assets for games. Uh, they are CC0, so that means that you don't need to pay for them. You can use them in commercial or personal projects. It's just completely public domain. Um, you don't have to attribute him either, but that's probably good practice to do that anyway. It's just polite. So I'm going to go on Kenny.nl, and we're going to look for... Um, I want to look, uh, blah, blah, blah. What, sorry? Oh, yeah, assets. There we go. Assets. Thank you. Uh, we're going to search for a character. So I'm going to search character and hope that we come up with something nice. Um, I don't know what we're feeling here. I might go with Toon Characters 1. I don't want to go with Toon Characters 1. That looks good to me. I'm going to go download. That's going to take a little while to download. So if I go show in folder. We should have 
our zip folder, and if all is well, this will contain a bunch of PNGs um, that make up the characters in this pack. Um, and we'll pick a, a nice one for our character. I probably won't bother with animation in this session, so this character is going to look quite janky. It's just going to be a static image just jumping around, but that's fine. Um, let's wait for that to finish. Um, I don't know which, which character we want to choose. I'll just go female adventurer and we'll see what this is like. Um, I'm just wondering, it'll probably have, okay. So this is going to contain lots of kind of poses of this character in a sprite sheet. And what we're going to do is we're going to import this into Unity. And then we're going to kind of slice this, this sheet into different parts, and that will let us pick which of these individual sprites to use. Um, if you were going to animate this character, then you'd basically build a system where it swaps between which kind of slice of the sprite that you're using, but we'll kind of skip that for now and probably come back to that in a later session. So if I want to import this into Unity, I'm going to, it's actually an HD version, so I'll pick that. So I'm going to copy that, and I'm going to go find my um, find my assets folder for this product. And I think I put this under I put this under uh, some tutorials. I think Unity tutorial session. Here we go. So I'll go to assets. Uh, I already made a folder called sprites, so I'm going to just paste it in there. And if I go back into Unity, it should import that. Um, and there we go. We've got our sprite sheet down here. Now, if I want to slice this into the different sprites like I mentioned, if we go to sprite mode, multiple, I think it's multiple, and then go to sprite editor, um, there's a slice option, and I'm going to go um, grid by cell count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. No, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, so there's nine columns and one, two, three, four, five, six rows. Um, am I going too fast? Has everyone caught up with this so far? Or? This part, so uh, if I clicked on the sprite sheet, and I go to sprite mode, I select multiple from the drop down. And then there's a button down here called sprite editor. If you click that, then it should open this little window up. Um, if this window doesn't appear and it tells you you don't have it installed, what you might need to do is go to window, uh, is it window package manager? And you might need to install the, uh, I think it's the sprite editor package. Um, so it will probably be 2D Sprite, yeah. Uh, if this doesn't appear, yeah, package manager in the window uh, drop down and just find the 2D Sprite package and just install that. Um, that's something that if you selected the 2D preset for the project, it already has that installed. So I've already got that. Um, and yeah, I go to slice and I'm going to do it grid by cell count, which lets me just put in how many columns and how many rows I have in this spreadsheet. And it's nine columns and six rows, if I can count properly, which I think I can. No, I can't, it's five, I can't count. <laughs> um, and I go slice, and you'll see that it has uh, separated each individual character into its own little slice here. Um, and we'll go apply at the top. Cool. Now, if I go down to the sprite sheet in the assets folder, or sorry, in the project window, it is in the assets folder, but in the project window, and click this little arrow here, it actually shows me the individual sprites. So I can use any one of these I want. If I wanted to drag this one in, then I can just do that, or this one. And I've got multiple different characters. Um, I'm just going to pick the first one, and it's going to look a little bit janky because this character isn't going to animate, it's just going to kind of move around like this, um, that's fine. Um, so yeah, now we have a character in our game. Um, 
any questions so far for uh, importing sprites and the sprite sheet editor? No, cool. I'm going to rename this because uh, it's going to give it the default name of the of the uh, sprite sheet. I'm just going to call this uh, something like character or maybe uh, player. Or player. Okay, so now we have the sprite in the game. Uh, so far, it's not going to be a very interesting game because we're just going to see a character stood on a floor, and that's not very interesting. So we're going to need to add something to the character to make it move, something to make it act physically. So I think I'm going to start off by adding uh, colliders and rigid bodies to this. So again, if you missed last week's session, we talked about 2D physics. So I'll just kind of blast through that. Um, if I want an object to act physically in a game, I will add a rigid body 2D. Uh, remember that there's a 3D version and a 2D version of all the physics components. Just make sure you select the 2D version. Um, and the rigid body will apply physics to this object. So if I were to play the game now, all being well, the character is just going to click to the floor because it doesn't have any collision attached to it. So I'm also going to go add components. Uh, I'm going to look for the right one. I'm going to go physics 2D in the drop down. And I think I will probably want to go with a capsule collider 2D. So if I select capsule collider 2D, um, this kind of gives us a capsule shape around the, the character, although currently it's too big. So I am going to want to make it a little bit slimmer around the x-axis. So if I give it something like that, so uh, how I did that is I hovered over the letter X here, and if you just click and drag left and right, it will increase or decrease the value. So if I have it maybe this this thin, this wide, um, and I look, again, along the Y, it's a little bit too tall, so I'm going to just decrease that a little bit, and then decrease the offset, so it's something like that. Uh, and I want to make it so that the, the bottom of the... Uh, the green part of the collider here, just about touches the floor. That's about right to me. So it's a little bit rough. If you're spending a little bit more time on this, then you'd probably make sure it's kind of a lot more exact, but it's good enough for me. Um, now if we were to play the game, um, let's see what that does. Cool. So our character is now just stood on the floor, not moving or anything. But it's not clipping for the floor anymore. Great. Um, one thing we are going to need to do to our character, and I will do it now before we um, before we add any movement. If we were to just leave the rigid body physics and the collider as it is, when we start to move the character, they're going to kind of roll over and fall over because they have a round bottom to uh, to their feet collider, I guess. Uh, so one thing I'm going to do is on the rigid body 2D, I'm going to go to constraints and I'm going to freeze its rotation because I don't want the character to kind of start doing this. Um, it's not going to look very realistic. Uh, we want this character to always be oriented upwards. And if we lock the rotation, then it can't ever rotate. Um, so that's just on the rigid body 2D, the constraint section, there's this little arrow here, it's drop down, and you just click uh, freeze rotation Z. Um, if this were a rigid body 3D, then you can freeze the position and the rotation along more axes, but there's only one rotation axis in 2D, so just walk around the Z. Um, so even if I even if I were to rotate the character like this. If I were to play the game and the rotation isn't locked to it, I would expect this to land and just kind of roll on its side. But all being well, if I do this, hopefully she will just kind of plonk downwards and be at an angle. Um, so I'm just going to undo the rotation there because that will look really silly. So we've got we've got the, the rigid body and the collider set up on our character. And now we're going to add some movement. So. This is going to require a little bit of scripting. So I'm going to go to scripts, and I'm going to go create C sharp script, and I'm going to call this player movement. Um, there we go. 
Uh, let's wait for Visual Studio to load up, of course. Okay, so similar to our first session, we're going to basically want to read the input axes from the keyboard and make the character do something. Briefly, in last week's session, we talked about adding forces and changing the velocity of a rigid body. And the way I'm going to change the, or the way I'm going to move the character, I'm going to change its velocity directly. There's several ways you can interact with physics. Some people will just ignore the physics engine directly and move the transform position. But if you have a rigid body attached to an object, that's generally not the way you do it. Um, you can do that, but a better way of doing it is rather than adding to the position, if you modify the velocity directly, is generally considered the way to move a rigid body around in scripting. So well, either moving the velocity or adding a force. If we were to build a character movement system where we add force, then Unity works out the velocity for us. And that means we can do stuff like, uh, if there's other objects in the scene, we can maybe like swing a crate into the player and they will automatically move for us realistically. But for a game like ours, we might want to just set the velocity directly because we're not expecting there to be external forces that we want to act on the character. Um, there's a subtle kind of distinction here. If we set the velocity directly in code, then if something swings into the player, then we'll kind of override that because we're setting the velocity. But that's fine for a game like this. So that's kind of a long-winded explanation, but basically I'm going to set the velocity to move the player. Um, and the way we're going to do that is um, we're actually going to do it in... What's the best way to do this? I think I want to use the I want to use the update function, and I'm also going to talk about fixed update. So so far, when we've been writing code to update something every single frame, we've used the update function, and this is great because that lets us do stuff over time. But Unity actually has two different update loops. One of them, update, it just runs once per frame. But there's also the fixed update function. And this tries to run, by default, it tries to run 50 times a second, I think it is. Uh, which is a little bit awkward. I think it's 50. Um, fixed update is usually where you do physics. Um, because the, the underlying physics loop runs at a fixed time interval rather than the frame rate, or the update loop, which can run at a variable interval. Um, if you remember back in the first session, when we were moving the object, I multiplied by uh, it was called time dot delta time, and that made our movement frame rate independent. Because if we didn't do that, then some frames take longer to process than others. And that's kind of really awkward. Uh, we'd have kind of jittery movement. With a fixed update loop, it tries to run at a regular time interval. So it will, tie, it will try to move, it will try to do stuff every, I think it's 0 0.02 seconds, if it's 50 frames per second. Um, and this is where you normally do physics operations. But there's another wrinkle here, because reading the input, you usually do that in update, because the inputs get updated in the update loop, but then we're going to want to move things in the fixed update loop, and it's a little bit awkward. So. Basically, what we're going to do in this script is read the input from the keyboard in the update loop and then do the movement in fixed update. So we're basically going to uh, remember what the movement state was in update and then the next time fixed update gets ran, it will use those, uh, those values. So I'm going to start off by having, I'm going to have some private variables here. So I'm going to call it a uh, private, let's say, uh, I'll make this a vector. So I'll have a private vector to movement. Sure, that works. And then in my update loop, I'm just going to read the uh, read the inputs on the keyboard. Um, I'm going to do this in a slightly different way to how I did it last time. Last time I read the keys directly, but in the background, Unity has what's called axes set up. Um, and I can show you those actually. So, 
rather than kind of checking individual keys and saying, you know, is A pressed or is left arrow pressed, Unity has this nice system where if we go to, I think it's, I don't remember where this is now, uh, edit project settings uh, input manager. Uh, it's a little bit kind of weird to get your head around when you first see it, but Unity has set up some automatic ways of reading, you know, am I holding either the left arrow or the A key or the left stick on a joypad? And we can just reference that in one kind of easy way rather than having to read all of those things individually in scripting. Um, so for example, it has the horizontal axis set up and the horizontal axis is going to return a value between, I think it's minus one and one, depending on whether I'm holding left arrow or the A key, but also if I'm holding the right arrow or the D key. So if we're doing WASD movement. Um, so rather than last time where I said input dot get key or get key down, I'm going to say input dot get access. And then I pass in a string, a name, and the name of the axis I'm trying to get here is just horizontal. And that is going to be a float, a floating point number, so a, um, a number between minus one and one. So we're going to say uh, float x equals that. That's all good. And we can do the same with the vertical. Um, so I'm going to say float y equals input dot get access vertical. Uh, so these two values are just going to be how much we're moving in the x and y axes. Um, and then I'm going to say movement equals new vector to x comma y. So I'm reading the two axes and I'm storing them in a vector two called movement. Um, and because I've declared this outside of the function, uh, this value is just kind of updated every frame and I'll be able to read this in fixed update when it runs. Um, so, so far, uh, of course the code won't do anything uh, visually if we run this. So I'm going to also do the fixed update code as well now. Um, so for the fixed update code, we need access to the rigid body attached to this object. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to, first of all, declare a variable to hold it. So I'm going to say private rigid body 2D. I'm going to call it, call it I'm going to call it RB, just for short. I'm going to assign this at the start of the game because this object is always going to have a rigid body from the start. And you know, it's not going to keep having to check if I have a rigid body. So I can just say, at the start of the game, here's where the rigid body is, just remember that forever. So I'm going to say, private void start. Um, so just to recap, start, update, and fix update are special Unity functions that Unity will call at the appropriate time. So start gets called whenever this object is created, basically. So that's usually at the start of the game, if we were adding if we were creating new objects at runtime, its start method, its start function would get called when it gets created. So in start, I'm just going to say RB equals get component rigid body 2D. So remember the syntax for this is kind of weird. We have the function, but we pass in the type that it's looking for in these angle braces, which is just the less than and greater than sign. Um, so we're trying to get a rigid body 2D. And we assign that to the RB variable. And then in fix update, we will start doing stuff to it. Hello. Um, so we're going to basically change its velocity. So I'm going to say RB.velocity equals, and in fact, we're going to say movement here. And that will do. Uh, we're going to find this movement's quite slow. So I should be able to just play the game here. Go down input manager, project settings. So on the player, I will take the player movement script and drag it on. Uh, if you drag it on, you have to drag it kind of like at the bottom of the list here. It's kind of annoying. So we have the player movement script now. 
and the character and all being well, we need to kind of go. It's very slow because it's only between minus one and one. And in fact, uh, now I'm realizing I don't know why I did the Y movement because that's not really going to be applicable here. But um, I, you can't, you also can't see this. I can do it with either WSD or the arrow keys here. So the axes are working as intended. Um, you'll also see she kind of like very slowly falls, and that's because Unity still tries to apply gravity to it, even though we're modifying the velocity directly. It's kind of weird, but. Um, so we've got a character kind of moving around. Um, I am now also going to add a public variable here. So I'm going to call this public float, and I'm going to call this speed. Um, because she's moving kind of slowly at the minute, and I kind of want to be able to change this at rent, like uh, in the Unity editor. So uh, let's say the default is about five. Um, and then down here, we're going to say movement times speed. Um, and I'm actually going to, I'm going to get rid of the Y movement here. Let's just say zero. Um, hello. Yeah, and problem. Hmm. Use gravity. Yeah, good point. Um, I don't know how to do this. Form of adding force is I never get the X direct, the X movement working properly. Um, I think it's the best way of doing that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Because you can kind of yeah, you can work out the forces yourself and add the way back in. I guess. Um, Also, you can also instead just update the root point position instead. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think what we're going to do... Okay, I'm going to keep it like this, and I'm going to have the X movement, you do this, and then on the velocity, instead of... Um, so this is going to cut out gravity completely. Yeah, you are right. Uh, what I'm going to do is... Very cheeky. Instead of uh, overloading the entire thing, I am, this is kind of annoying how I've written it here now. Uh, if instead of this being a vector two, I could say, um, I'm gonna make this a float and I'm gonna call it X movement. <laughs> I'm gonna say X movement equals just the X value here, or I can just say, uh, directly there, I can just say x, x movement equals the horizontal uh, axis uh, input reading. And then down here in fixed update, I'll say, I'll overload the, the velocity directly, but I'll just say um, the x component will be x movement, and the y component is going to be rb.velocity.y. So, yeah, a uh, good spot there. Uh, Basically, what I'm doing here is I'm manually overriding the x component of the velocity, but I'm letting the y component of the velocity act physically as Unity will automatically calculate it. That makes a lot more sense. Um, <laughs> so if I, I'll leave that up for a second there. If I play the game now, it should automatically. Yeah, if I walk off the edge of the edge of the uh, floor, then it should just fall. Um, and then after this, we'll work on a way of adding a force upwards for the jumping. That makes a lot more sense. Um, so if I just play the game now, I just let Unity reload all the scripts and then press play. All going well. I should be able to kind of move left and right. Um, did I multiply by speed? I'll have a look at the code again in a minute. Uh, and then I should just kind of fall off. There we go. Good stuff. Uh, I did not, so okay, I'll do that times speed. I'll do that again, I should walk about five times faster. Exactly, exactly five times faster. Uh, I think I'm okay with this. There's a kind of a lot of decisions you make when making the character controller, because sometimes you will want the character to kind of slide around a lot. But sometimes you want it to kind of you want exact control over 
over the character, I guess. Um, so yeah, this is this is moving about five times faster than it was now. Mm. And we can throw her off the edge. Um, the last thing I think we want to add to the player movement for now is jumping. So uh, this time I am actually going to. Well, no, I don't want the vertical. I probably want this to be jump. So if I go back to the project settings input manager, one of the axes is called jump. So it's got a jump axis set up for us. Um, and this is a little bit different because rather than being an axis, this is a button. So it's very similar. If I just say, uh, I think it's input .get button down. This is similar to the key down that we had in the first session. We'll reference this with a name, so, oh, not button, uh, jump. Uh, so basically, this is going to get us, you know, did we press the jump button this frame? And the jump button can be either the space bar or on a controller, it would probably be like A or something like that. Um, and this returns a Boolean. So we're actually going to say, um, Actually, I think we're going to save this in a variable. So I'm going to make another variable here called private uh, pool is jumping. And that's going to start out as false. I'm going to say if. No, sorry, we're going to say, uh, ignore that. We're going to say uh, is jumping equals that. Because uh, so I want to cache that value in update. Um, and then in fix update, I want to apply that. So I'm going to say in fix update, uh, if is jumping is true. And of course, the shortcut here is you don't actually have to include the e equals equals true. You can just say is if is jumping, but we'll have the whole thing there, so it's a bit clearer. Uh, so if I'm jumping, so if I've pressed the spacebar, this frame. I will want to add some kind of force upwards. Um, so I'm going to say rb dot add force. And the amount of force we're going to add is going to be, I'm going to say new vector 2. And it's going to be 0 on the x-axis. We don't want to add any force horizontally, or else we're going to jump kind of forwards, backwards. Um, We'll just put a magic number here for now. We'll say five, probably, and we'll see how that works. But that's not all I'll do. So last time when we added forces, we just added a force. But there's actually different force modes I can use here. So by default, it will add a force. Uh, think about how to explain the difference. Uh, we've seen how like the default version works, but there's another way of doing this called force mode dot impulse. Um, force mode dot force is for applying usually a constant force to an object. So if I'm pushing something, I'm basically always, or for like for a while, I'm applying the pushing force to the object. So on this chair, like I'm applying the force over several frames. Force mode dot impulse is great if I want the velocity to change instantaneously. So a jump is like a force that happens like once. It only happens on one frame, and I just jump up instantly. Um, so force mode dot impulse is going to have like a very like immediate effect on the velocity of the object. Um, so if I had if I had an impulse of five upwards, that might not be enough, but we'll we'll kind of change the value. I'll make that a variable in a second. So I'll go back into Unity. I don't reload the scripts because it's always disagious. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, you charger. So I've got to set this up beforehand. Yeah. 
Okay, cool. <laughs> Charge rushes that. Um, close that down again. So where were they? Yes, adding adding a force impulse to jump. Um, I'll play the game now. If I press the space bar, my character will jump. Now it actually jumps kind of quite high there. Uh, so five is probably a bit much. Um, if I make this into a variable, so if I say uh, I made that about 2.5 to begin with uh, by default. So uh, this syntax here, I put the F at the end there because that basically tells Unity this is a float. There's other types of number you can use here. F just says float, basically. Um, so I try and include that. Uh, so yeah, instead of doing 5, I'll say jump force. So if I go back into Unity, I now will be able to change that on the player movement scripts if I decide that this jump force is too much or too little. It's a lot easier than going back into the code every time. I see, so 2.5 is probably not enough. Um, not strange that it's inconsistent. Uh, any idea what that might be? Is it colliding with something on the way up? Or? Hmm. Yeah, I know that problem happens, but yeah. It should just be doing on, it's on button down, so it should, it should be the same height every time here. No, it seems mostly consistent, so we'll live with it for now. And if I figure out what's going on, I'll come back to that. Um, okay, so we have this jumping. I think we could probably have three here instead of 2.5, so it's a little bit higher. Um, so reload. It's a little bit inconsistent still. That's strange. I don't know why it's doing that. Uh, setting an impulse. I don't think I have to do those in the opposite order. Uh, you know, we'll live with it for now, and if I figure out what's going on there, I'll come back to that. Uh, so yeah, now we have the other problem uh, that Joshua was kind of mentioning there, that I can just spam the spacebar and I'll just kind of fly forever. Um, it's a very, uh, very beginner thing to do when you're building a character controller. So we're going to basically have a way of checking if we're on the ground, and we're only going to let the character jump if they are touching the ground. Um, and there's a few ways of doing this. Uh, one way that some people sometimes do is they will check if the collider is colliding with anything that is a floor. Um, the problem with doing that that I can foresee is if I were to have, uh, for example, something like this, where uh, maybe the character, you know, they're going to come here, they're going to jump, they're going to be contacting the floor on the side, and then they'll be able to jump again. Which you might want to have if you have some kind of like wall jumping mechanic in your game. Um, but what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to do what's called a raycast. And I'm going to kind of conceptually what happens here is I'm going to have when I start a ray from a point. So maybe in like close to the floor. So from like this point here, it's going to kind of like point down. And it's going to check, basically, am I pointing at something that's tagged floor? Um, so this interacts with the Unity's physics system. And raycasts are really powerful for well, stuff like jumping, stuff like uh, if you have like a, a laser gun or something and you want to point in a direction and say, am I hitting that? Then you'll do a raycast from like the gun's tip forwards and say, is this hitting something? Or if you're just shooting a gun, some people in shooting games, they'll just have 
the, the most basic way of shooting is to just do a ray cast and say, is this going to, is that, get me the object that's the first thing in front of this gun and tell it I've hit it with the gun. Um, we're just going to use the ray cast, point it downwards and say, is this lockable? Um, so there's a few things we might want to set up before doing that. Um, by default, a ray cast is just going to point forwards and find any collider in the scene and say, am I colliding with anything? But we might have some problems where there will be colliders in the scene that we don't want to be able to jump off of, or sometimes it can be a bit weird if we have triggers in the scene and we can sometimes detect those. It's um, best if we tag everything with floor. Um, so basically we label everything that we want to be a floor as a floor, and then we're going to check if the thing that we raycast into is a floor. Um, so I'm going to quickly do that. Uh, for both the floors that I added here, I think I'll keep them both in for now. I'm going to select both of them. And up here, you'll see the section called tag. Now you can add tags to any object in Unity. Uh, and in this one, we're going to add a new tag. And we'll have this list of tags that Unity has here. So if you miss that, uh, actually it doesn't matter if I select them all out. If I just select something, go to the tag drop down here and select add tag. Then on this tags drop down, I will add a tag and I'll call it floor. So now we have this floor tag. And we can select anything in the scene that we want and tag it with floor. So Unity includes some things to begin with just by default. So you may or may not find these helpful. Uh, I'm just going to tag this floor. Um, I'm going to save the game there. I'm going to draw this. Uh, I'm just going to check if I can reach the second platform just for testing. Um, no, cool. Ah. Select this that one and make it a little bit lower. <laughs> In hindsight, maybe I do want the jump force to be about five. Yeah, there we go. I'll make it about five again. Um, make the jump force five. Uh, you, of course, you can place platforms wherever you want and just check um, if they, uh, if the character, if the movement feels good to you. Um, a little bit higher. So in the scripting, uh, back in our uh, player movement script. We want to do this check now. So basically, when we do this is jumping, and then we check the um, check the axis, instead, we're going to want to first check, are we on the floor? <laughs> so I'm just giving myself a little bit of space there. And we're going to say, um, I think it's a, the function is physics2d.raycast. And there's a few things we need to pass into here. So first of all, uh, Visual Studio is quite useful here because it will actually list every single version of this function that I can type. Uh, it might be a little bit small on this screen, but if I press the down arrows, I'll see every single kind of variation of things I can pass into this function. Um, so the default version, it just has a vector two origin and a vector two direction. So the origin's where the ray's going to start and the direction's the direction it's going to go in. Um, we can also add a float distance. So if we want to check a very limited distance, which we will want to, um, there's no point if we just check infinitely downwards if there is a floor below us, because then we'll still have the same problem of we'll hit a floor below us somewhere and jump infinitely. We will want to check maybe like wherever the, th wherever the raycast starts, just, just enough that it will touch a floor, basically. Um, and there's other kind of things you can add here. So you, um, we will probably just deal with the second version, which has an origin, a direction, and a distance now. Um, so the origin is going to be somewhere near the player, near their feet. Um, and this might take a little bit of working out, but it's going to be basically transform. If you remember, the transform is the component that has the position rotation scale. So transform dot uh, position. That's going to get its position in the world. So if we did it from here, transform position would do the ray pass in the center of the character. Uh, we can do it a little bit lower. So if we just estimate how tall this character is, 
Uh, one of these little squares here is a unity unit, so that's one by one. Uh, they are uh, probably about two here, two unity units. So, um, sorry, if we do the raycast here, it will actually be from this point uh, where these uh, this, these controls are. So, I want to do it from about one unit lower down. So. Uh, I want to do it from about here-ish. Um, so I'm going to take the transform position and take away a slight amount. So that's um, physics to do it, guess, transform to position minus vector to zero in the x and about one on the y. Is that going to complain at me? It's going to complain at me because it wants a vector three. So I'm going to add a zero on the z as well. Um, that's where it's going to start. The direction is going to be, um, just, okay, just to explain what happened there, if you have a vector three and you take away a vector two, Unity doesn't know what to do. So because transform to position is technically a vector three, it has three components rather than two, we need to also have a vector three for what we're taking away from it. But Unity is going to read this. That whole thing evaluates to a vector three, but because this function takes in a vector two, it's just going to ignore the z component. Um, so the second the second argument to this function is the direction. So I just want this to be. I actually don't need to do. I can do vector vector two dot up, which is a vector that's always available. It just points upwards. I want to say minus that because I. Did they change? Oh no, okay, they still have it to do drop down. It's even easier. But to do drop down, um, I thought they'd remove those. Uh, it's about to do drop down, and point downwards. And the, the, the distance, I'm going to have to estimate this as well. I might need to tweak this a little bit. But uh, if we do like 0.5 for now, and we'll see how that, that goes. Uh, so we have this function, it will do the raycast. Uh, but what information do we get back out from the raycast? Um, it's actually called a raycast hit 2D. So I am going to create a variable called hit object or hit obj, and it's of type raycast hit 2D. And this, this variable is going to store basically the first thing that the raycast hits. Um, that's all good stuff. Um, I'm actually just trying to remember, will the raycast by default ignore the collider of the object itself? I think it does. Uh, it starts inside of it, so yeah. It starts inside, so I think it ignores this object. Um, if it doesn't, then we can account for that. So, yeah, if it didn't automatically correct for this, then the first object we hit is ourself, but Unity should know that and should ignore that. So. Right, we've got the head obj. Basically, we can say if, so we're going to do the check now to check if this is a flaw, because um, it's perfectly valid that the hit obj could be anything else that's not a flaw that we don't want to be able to jump off of. So we'll do if hit obj, and this is a raycat hit 2d. So every single unity component, or every single, no, ignore that. Uh, we can get the transform. Uh, so I think it's transform.tag, yeah. So we're going to get that tag that I mentioned, and we can get the tag through the transform class. So uh, we'll access the transform, and that's going to let us uh, access the tag, and we want to check if that's a flaw. So we say if head obj.transform.tag equals, so double equals, and then we'll say flaw. Um, there's other ways of doing this. So you can do a comparison of strings here. I think you can also do um, transform dot, I think it's compare tag. So there's a, there's a function for us as well. So either of these works. I think doing it this way is a little bit safer. I can't remember what problems you might uh, run into, but I'm gonna do it like this. So it's going to compare the tag of what we hit with the string for, and if it is the same, it will do the code inside. Um, so then we're gonna uh, I'm gonna cut and paste that there. 
So only if we're touching the floor is it going to check our jump uh, button. Um, and we'll see in a minute if 0.5 was far enough for the raycast to see if that works. Um, I'll just leave that on screen for a couple more seconds so people can see that. Are there any questions so far about the code? Nope. Yet. I'll let people think it's still dropping that down. Um, And you're all good. We'll see that in action now. Um, all being well, we will be able to jump off both of these platforms. Um, okay, so we still land on them. And of course, when I press space, it doesn't work. So we might need to make this a little bit. I'm going to make this. I'm going to make it one. And I'm just going to see how far I need to go with it. Sometimes when you're making games, you need to just play around with the numbers to get it to work properly. Um, so I'll play the game again, see if it works. Uh-oh. Get rid of the, uh, what's it called? The minus vector. Yeah. Okay, I'll get rid of this. I'll have to make this a little bit bigger. Um, yeah, we'll make this two, we'll make it ridiculous, and then we'll see if it works. It might not be taking this object into account, I don't think, maybe, possibly. Um, but there is a way around that, and we can do that if it doesn't work still. Um, okay. Uh, I think it might be colliding with itself. Just think of what it's getting. What it's yeah. Um, okay, so this is something we haven't seen so far, either. Uh, you can do debug.log and then pass in basically anything. And Unity is going to tell us what that is. Uh, and it will do that in the console down here. So if I wait for this script to compile and then click console, um, any, any error that you get will be here. But we can also tell Unity to put stuff in the, in the console. Um, so I'll play again. And we're going to see what it's actually colliding with. Um, it's actually, what is it colliding with? Um, you have to, like, <laughs> get, get the object from there. Of course you do. <laughs> uh, actually, do I want to probably want uh, dot... I can't do dot game object, okay. I'm going to do hit object to transform the game object, and that should get us, uh, it should at least tell us the name of it. Um, so, all being well, um, okay, it's giving us the player. So, the problem that I thought it wasn't going to have, it is having. It's doing the ray cast because it's starting inside the player's collider, it's just colliding with that. Um, trying to remember, is there is there an overload that Let's us just tell it not to do that. Um, I don't know where there is, is there? Uh, okay, that's fine. What we're going to do instead is another system of sorting uh, through things in Raycast called layers. Um, I mean, this is the way I was going to suggest. You just want to do layers, yeah. Instead of doing tags, because tags are actually not that good. Yeah. So you're going to do one. Yep. You Yep. So, uh, the tag system didn't work. Instead, we're going to use layers. Uh, layers are somewhat similar, but completely different. <laughs> uh, so, okay, uh, I'm going to select one of these. Uh, select the layer drop down, and I'm going to go add layer. And then you have a limited number of layers, so it's a little bit different than tags. I'm going to add a layer called floor. Um, once I've done that, I'll select both my floors, and on the layer dropdown, uh, select the floor layer. Um, back in the code, when we do this raycast, uh, we can tell it to look only at certain layers. So, um, the raycast normally is just checking every single collider in the in the scene and 
it's going to get any collider. So evidently that includes the player, but we don't want it to do that. What we're instead going to do is I'm going to need to add another variable here. I'm going to call it public layer mask. Um, and I'm going to call it something like floor check mask. And a layer mask is something that we can use to filter out what layers we want to look for. Um, and they're pretty easy to use. So uh, they we kind of use those back in the Unity editor. I'll show you that in a second. Back on the Raycast, after the origin, the direction, and the distance, we can also include the layer mask. So I'm going to say floor check mask as the last component here, or the last argument of the function. So we have origin, transform to position, uh, vets two down, so we're pointing downward still. Uh, We'll play around with the distance in a second, and we're using this floor check mask. So it's only going to check floor colliders. Um, this is actually going to be quite nice, because if we have, uh, if we're inside a trigger, then it's going to completely ignore that, and that's good. Um, so once we've included the floor check mask there, wait for it to compile all my scripts on the player. On the player movement script, we have this kind of little box here. If I if I press it, it looks very similar to the uh, layer list here. Uh, if I make sure that the player, I'm going to need to charge my laptop in a minute. I can. T it's getting sluggish. On the layer uh, drop down, uh, make sure that it's just default. Don't make sh don't add the floor layer to the player, of course. Um, and then on the floor check mask, we're going to select floor. And the nice thing about masks like this is I can actually include more than one thing. So if I wanted to check for floors or water for some reason, then I can select both. We're only going to check floors for now. Um, now here press play. Fingers crossed. Now it should do the raycast. It should see the floor and let us jump. Yep. Okay, it's crying at me a little bit, but I think that was fine. Um, I'm going to need to plug in my laptop because it's being really, really slow. Well, do you um, know we need to check the uh, now? Yeah, I don't. Uh, I actually, yeah, I don't need this anymore. So I can comment all those out. Or I can just delete those. So I'll just have... Uh... Oh, I do actually need to... Um... What I will need to do is say if hits obj uh, not equals null, or I think it's obj dot transform poly. Uh, so I think it's still there. We go. So basically, if the raycast fails, hit obj dot transform won't have anything in it because we're not colliding with anything. So. We're going to have to check if that's null. So remember that null means nothing. Uh, there we go. So this is basically saying, yeah, did we find anything? Yeah, we did. We can jump. Cool. Um, and we will run that again. And I'll see what we get. Wait for our best friend, the loading box. Progressively taking longer now. I think my laptop's getting sluggish. I press space. Okay, they're just launching into the air, and I think they're doing that because my laptop is running really slow and the physics calculations are a bit off. Uh, I will find my souls in power. Give me a second.
clear right. You will be able to just reach from here. Cool. All right, let's try that again. <laughs> it should run smoother this time. There we go. Okay, cool. That's worrying that it's not working every single time. Uh, hmm. Okay, is that Raycast actually going far enough? It should be. Um, it doesn't work every single time I hit a head jump. Just trying to figure out why. But it doesn't work, well, it shouldn't work if I hammer the jump button. Uh oh! Okay. Well, I mean, it can, right? Because the thing is, is that if if you press jump and then it only goes up slightly and then you spam. Oh yeah, if I spam click it, if the ray is too far, then yeah. yeah. Um, so this is actually going to need to be... Uh, trying to judge how far that is. Probably 1.5, 1.6. So yeah, you're right. If, you're, if your ray cast is 2 and, you know, it's like checking up to about here, then you could hit it in 2 consecutive frames and it's just going to leap upwards because it's going to add an impulse when it's already really fast. Okay, so it's definitely long enough. Um, but it still doesn't work every single time. That's really weird. Do you know what the problem could be? Uh, I mean, you're going to deep up the ray. Yeah. I mean, I personally use the method where one collision just reset a billion to the left. Yeah. I probably should have chosen that method. <laughs> no, we might actually debug the ray. It's, um... We debug the ray. Oh, you want to draw it? Uh, okay. Uh, draw ray, and then is it just going to be... I don't think I've ever used this before. Um, if you multiply down by like, 1.5. Uh, okay. Is the duration how long it is for? Okay. Um, and if you just do like color, color, store it. Yeah. Uh, you have to do side by side game and scene. Oh, with this, um, oh, it won't show in the game view, will it? <coughs> okay, it's busy. <laughs> Taking a sweet time. Uh, yeah, okay, so if I put the scene and game side by side like that. Uh, this is one of the other nice things about Unity, is you can have the scene and game view open, so... Um, I can play in the game here and see the scene right side by side. So yeah, the red is kind of... I mean, that's enough distance. Yeah. Do you want to try and break it and see what happens? So I'm pretty sure there's an arrow still being spammed in the... Uh... Yeah, that was when I was slogging. Um... Ooh. Big lag spike. <laughs> Yeah, that's really strange. It's not every single time. Um, I mean, the only okay, you know what it might be? It's because I'm doing this in update. Um, okay, you know what? I was trying to be smart and saying about how it checks update, uh, checks input and update, so I was doing an update and then doing the physics in. Yeah, I think this is actually fine. We'll try it. With the variables, you 
<laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, that's going to immediately. Oh, God. Okay. Uh, that was even worse. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> I'll be honest, I'm not entirely sure why it's not working every time, but... I will stare out this code after the session and try and work out what the problem is, and maybe formulate a different way of doing it, and then post that in the Discord. We have a teaching session uh, channel. Um, I mean, this should work, but evidently it doesn't. So I'm going to ignore the fact it's not working and just move on to the next section. Um, that's basically how you do a character controller in 2D and Unity. Um, with the exception of normally it's not as buggy as that. Uh, I don't know what the problem could be, but we'll just move on from now uh, rather than getting stuck on that. Um, Alright. So we've got our completely working character controller with no bugs and we're able to move the character around. Um, so far, we're just using bots colliders on all of our platforms, but uh, in some platformers, uh, you're able to sometimes jump kind of like from below a platform through it and land on it and collide with it. And Unity has a very nice alternative kind of collider for that. So I'm going to select this uh, platform. I'm going to remove the bots collider and I'm going to go to the add component, physics 2D, and I think it's just called the platform effector. Um, okay, I didn't need to remove the collider. In fact, I shouldn't have done, so I'm going to add the collider back and pretend I didn't delete it. Um, so we talked about effectors last time, and effectors just affect the forces applied to objects, and it affects uh, colliders in different ways. Uh, so we saw the point effector, which is like a, a magnet, basically. Um, and we saw the buoyancy effector, which is like a pool of water. It will look like buoyancy to an object. Now we're going to use the platform effector. Uh, similar to last time, we have... So we have our box slider. We need to take the used by effector. Um, tick box <laughs> here. Um, and the platform effector is going to do what I described, where we basically want the top edge of this to act as, um, act as a one-way collider. So if an, if an object is jumping through it, we want it to basically ignore the collision. But if it's falling downwards, we want it to collide with the object. So we should be able to, if I move this kind of here, uh, if we were to jump up, we should be able to just go jump up and then land on it. Um, so it's one way. And I've given it a surface arc. So you can see this kind of this blue gizmo that's here. And this gives us the surface arc. So I could change that if I want uh, to be a little bit weird. Um, so that will only let me collide on it if I'm approaching from an angle of 90 degrees. But for this platform, it doesn't make sense. We just want it to stay as 180. Um, <coughs> I'm going to see if that works as is. Um, we might need to change the box collider. Uh, it's been a while since I've used these. So. OK, so it seems to be, uh, at least during the first part, doesn't bloody jump properly. Uh, that's fine. Um, yeah. On my player, I'm going to increase the jump force to about 10, just so we can jump a bit higher. And I'm going to test that again. Ooh. There we go. OK, good. So that's how you do one-way colliders. Um, these are super helpful, of course, for platformers. Um, you might not want to do it this way. You might want to have platforms that are two-way, all of them. But um, I find this, I find this especially useful for platformers. Um, but yeah, so that was dead easy to just have one-way colliders. Um, so now we've got one-way colliders. Um, what to add next? Um, we can either add next and end of the level or we can add enemies. We will need to add camera movement at one point as well, and there's several ways of doing that. Um, I think the first thing we'll do is camera movement and try and get that out of the way. So this is going to be another script. 
I'm going to right click, create C sharp script, and I'm going to call it camera, control. And there's several ways we can do a camera in a 2D game like this. We, of course, want the camera to follow the player, but we can either follow the player by kind of lagging behind them a little bit, or we can follow the player by just sticking exactly to the position. Um, or we can have kind of fancier cameras where they kind of pan forwards if the player's moving forward, or pan slightly backwards if the player starts moving backwards. Um, I am going to take the approach of a camera that follows the player, but kind of lags behind them, and the player will be centered in the middle of the camera. Um, and that's quite easy to do. Uh, famous last words, I thought the collision was easy to do, but here we are, um, ray casting. So, uh, first thing we want is a reference to the player. Uh, so the camera needs to know what it's looking at. Uh, just to kind of let you know, I'm gonna attach this script to the main camera directly. So I'm going to say public. And it's going to be transform with a capital T uh, and call it player. So this could track any object, but uh, we'll just stick the player here. Um, I don't think we need anything on start, uh, but an update, we basically want to change the position of the camera. Um, so in one of the sessions, I did briefly mention that even <coughs> in a 2D game, even, yeah, even though this is 2D, it still has in 3D space. So every single object we've added so far has zero on the z-axis, except for the main camera, which has minus 10, because it's behind everything else. Uh, if this was zero, then it wouldn't render anything properly. So we'll be mindful of that when we're moving the camera, because we're going to want to set the z-axis directly to minus 10 on the camera. Um, but for now, we'll just worry about uh, how to follow the player. So we could just say transform dot position equals player dot position, and then um, and then modify the z. But like I mentioned, this is just going to follow the player exactly, and it's going to be quite jarring if we move quite quickly. We're going to want some kind of way of lagging behind the player, um, and there's some proper ways of doing this, and there's some hacky ways of doing this. And I'm going to go with a hacky way of doing it because it's the easiest way of doing it. Um, so there is a function called LERP, which stands for Linear Interpolation, which is a really long term that basically just means um, if I want to get from one value to another value, it's a function that just kind of smoothly goes between the two values. Um, and we're going to abuse that a little bit. This isn't how you're meant to use LERP, but this is like the easiest way of doing this. So um, I'm basically going to say... Uh, so I'm actually going to be, it's going to be a vector free and I'm going to call this position or pause. Um, I'm going to declare that. Then I want to say uh, pause equals, um, how do I want to do this? I'm going to say pause equals. Okay, so it's vector free dot lerp. Um, vector three dot lerp. And the start point is going to be where I currently am. So transform dot position. And the place I want to be is the player's position. And the third variable that we're going to pass into the LERP function is basically how far along the line between those two points we want this function to return. Uh, the correct way of using the LERP function is this value is normally between 0 and 1. And you normally run this function for, say, if you run it over a second. You want it to start with a value of zero and then go to a value of one within a second and it smoothly does that. The way we're going to do it is we're just going to basically pass in a small kind of delta here. So if I say time dot delta time and times that by some random value like maybe 2.5. And for now, uh, what this is doing, in fact, I can just do, I don't need to declare it on a separate line like that. I'll just say pulse equals that. Um, it's basically going to move a little bit along the line between transformed opposition and player opposition every frame. Um, the reason we're using delta time is it's going to be frame independent. 2.5 is going to basically be the speed. Um, and then we're going to say pause.z equals minus 10. So 
we'll manually set the z position back to minus 10. Because what this will do, uh, it will also interpolate the z, and it's going to slowly move the z to zero on the camera, and we don't want that to happen. Um, so we're going to set the z there. And then we're just going to say transform.position equals pause. Um, that is a very quick and dirty and really hacky way of doing really easy camera movement. Um, all being well. Uh, I'll just leave it on screen for a little second so people can copy that if they still are. Um, any questions about this code so far? Or are we all good? All good. Um, I should have built the scripts there. So on my main camera, I'm going to take the camera control script I just wrote and drag it on. And then we're going to need to attach the player to this field here. So my player, I'm just going to left click, drag it onto this field here. And all being well, it should follow the player. It's actually play it following the player very quickly there. Uh, kind of following them exactly. That's not what I want. Uh, I'll turn this down a bit. Um, Okay, why are you not writing behind? <laughs> I know the reason why. Yeah? Uh, basically, what's happening is, you're, you've got your camera here, right? Mm -hmm. And your player's here. Yep. And this Z here, it's going along this line here, right? And then once it goes along this line, then you set the Z back here, like that. So yeah. you want to you wanna do player, player dot position minus... Uh, oh, yeah, of course, up. yeah. You that would make a lot more sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, no, you want to do... Do I want to... Um, uh, so do a uh, player up position, position minus... Uh, oh, I did this, didn't I? Oops. Um, that would be why. Right? Uh, yeah, so oh, I know you're setting it, which doesn't make sense. Um, this, this will yeah. work now, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to look a bit funky because... Yeah. You want to also do the thing that you're mentioning, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, so just do player dot position yeah. minus new vector. No, on that, on the. Ah! Right now. Just um. Change. No, 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 no. Ah. When you're doing the lab. Yeah. Do player dot position minus. Do you want it here, right? Um, new vector, vector 3, 0, 0, 10, minus 10. Ah, uh, no, it'll be 10 to minus 10. Yep. Um, I was just going to add it here, but that's okay. Um, I won't. Uh, cool. So I think this code will assume that the Z axis of the player is always zero, right? That's yes. fine. Because uh, it will always be zero. There's no reason we'll change that. So yeah. Now it's a little bit slow. Um, yeah, the reason it was doing that before is because I was manually setting the transform dot position to the player position. I forgot to take that out. Um, We'll add a. Oh, I want to have a variable called speed here, just uh, make it a bit easier. So, call it speed, and I'm going to make this uh, maybe about 5 by default. Even. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, if I have this uh, public variable, I can just modify this at, on the fly in UNC whenever I want. Um, oh, there we go. Right. So we've got our character. They're able to jump really flawlessly up, and the camera moves them. Good stuff. Um, I think we've got about half an hour left of the session. I think I said it will be about two hours. So um, I think we will do an end of the level now. Um, now, I don't know what the end of the level we want to be here. If we're doing a Mario platform, it would be a flag or something like that. Uh, we could just add whatever sprite we want. So for now, I can just debug and add a different character. Or I can look around on Kenny's assets and see if there's something nice here. Um, let's add... Uh, let's search for flagpole. No internet. Fantastic. 
Okay, my laptop is sometimes really annoying with the internet and it just decides not to connect, so we'll ignore that. I'm just gonna have, um, you wanna use a better sprite than this? I'm gonna use the character upside down and pretend that's a flagpole. So I'm gonna place this somewhere off here. Um, I'm just gonna add like a handful of uh, little platforms here, just so we have some kind of progression, something to do. And here's our flagpole. It's definitely a flagpole, I promise. Uh, I'm going to move it down there, and I'm going to rename that to flagpole. Uh, flag, flag, flagpole. Now, we talked briefly about triggers in the last session, and what we're basically going to want to do is we're going to have a trigger on this flagpole, and we'll check if the player <coughs> enters the trigger, and when they do, it's the end of the level. Um, if this were kind of a complete game, if you reach the end of the level, you would probably move the player to a different scene, um, which is very easy to do. In fact, we can do that at the end. Um, so yeah, basically, player goes into trigger, do something. Uh, usually move to a different scene. Um, you might do some other stuff, like you might have a score, and it might display the score or something like that. Um, we don't have a score of any kind, so we're just going to reload the level back to the start. Um, and I'll show you how to do that. So, we have the flagpole. We're going to need to add a physics 2D box collider 2D. We're going to make it a trigger. So just to recap from last time, triggers do not act as a physical boundary. So if I walk into this, it's not going to stop me from moving into it. A trigger is instead for just checking if something is within some bounds. And we're going to check if something enters the trigger and call some kind of function. Um, so that will work as is. Uh, it's got the trigger here. I'm going to add a script and I'm going to call it, I'm going to go right click, create C chart script, and I'm going to call this flagpole. Yep. Flagpole, I can spell, I promise. I'll open up the flagpole script. Um, right, so this is a similar story to what we did last time checking triggers. There is, well, there are several special functions that Unity calls when we're checking for triggers. So one of them was um, void on trigger enter 2D. So just make sure you've got the 2D version. Um, Unity, uh, well, Visual Studio will automatically fill this in for me if I press enter while I type in the name. But if not, we also pass in a collider 2D called collision. And this is basically the information of the collision that just happened. So this collision object contains um, what two items are colliding. So for us, it will be the player and the black hole, um, hopefully. And on trigger enter 2D is called whenever a collision starts. So only on the frame where the collision starts happening, on trigger enter 2D is called. Um, there's also on trigger stay 2D, which is called every single frame that the player stays inside the trigger, and on trigger exit, which is called only on the frame when the player exits the trigger. Um, and inside here, we basically just want to reload the scene. So to do that, we talked a little bit about namespaces in one of the other tutorials, and we basically need to import one of those. So Unity has a namespace that contains all the code for scene management. And that's called using Unity engine.scene management. So if we want to load a scene, we just say scene manager dot, I think it's just load scene. And then we need to go find the scene. Um, and there's several ways of doing this. Uh, there's a scene build index, so a built game will contain a list of scenes in some order, and we can use the order as an integer here. So if the game only has one scene in it, then if we said load scene zero, it's just going to load the one scene that we have. Uh, we can also use the string of the scene's name. So when we saved the scene file, if I just open that up, I called it just basic level. We can use that string to load the scene. Uh, that's probably the easiest way for us, so I'm actually going to use that method. Uh, what do they call it? Sorry, base, basic level. 
So you might have called that something different. Um, it's case sensitive and space sensitive as well. So uh, just make sure you get all that right. Um, I think that should work. Uh, what we are going to need to do, because if we run this just now, then it won't work. And that's because we need to go to file. And it's going to be build settings. So in the build settings, we have all of the settings we use when we're compiling the game into a playable version. Uh, just to briefly go over what's available here. Uh, you can select the platform you're building for. Uh, Unity supports basically everything. Um, but some of these things you will need to go back into the Unity Hub and install the build tools for those platforms, but that's fairly easy to do. Um, <laughs> we don't actually need to build the game here, I just need to add stuff to the build uh, kind of list. So the only scene we have in the build kind of list so far is the sample scene, which is the one that Unity creates to begin with. So I'm just going to say add open scenes, and it's going to open the basic level that I'm currently in. Um, and now it's in the builds list, so we can go to that level if we want. Um, if we don't add it here and we try to call that load scene function, Unity is just going to kind of complain and say, no, you can't do that. It's not in the builds list. But now it is. Um, so, yeah, just to kind of let you know, this is where you go to compile the game when you're done. Um, it's just the build button down here, but we won't bother with that because it takes ages. So we've got a flagpole, it's got the trigger around it. Um, it's just a box, that's fine. I am going to find the script we just wrote and I'm going to drag the flagpole script onto it. Um, now if we were to run this game, I think it will actually just continually reload the scene because all we're doing is saying, does something enter this trigger? If it does, then we'll load the level. And it's not performing any checks on what object is kind of in the trigger. And if you look closely, this floor is actually inside the trigger here. So we'll have to do a similar thing to what we did before and just basically check, is the player the thing interacting with this? And luckily, we have access to the collision here. The, the object that we're colliding with is inside this kind of object. So I think the easiest way here is actually tags. On the player object, I am going to add the player tag, which is one that Unity has by default. Um, you can also do this. Uh, you can also kind of turn off collisions to certain layers, but that's kind of a different way of doing that to what we did with the Raycast. So uh, we'll just do tags now. It's a bit easier. Um, so the player has the player tag. So yeah, just the tags drop down, player. It should be there already, and if it's not, you can just add that. Um, so, in this function, we're basically going to say if collision, so the collision is the object that contains all data about the collision, dot game object, that's going to get the object that we are colliding with. So, we are the flagpole, we're colliding with the player, hopefully. Um, or the floor. So this is either going to be the player or a floor. And we want to say, if this is the floor, don't do anything. Or rather, we want to say, if this is the player, then do something. So we're going to say, collision.gameaudit.compare tag. So same as we had before. Uh, compare tag player. So if that's the case, then we will uh, load the scene. Uh, any questions so far about all of the stuff? No, I think we're good. Cool. All being well, we should be able to get to the end of the level and then it will reload the scene. Um, and when you reload a scene, it puts everything back in the default position. So if we get to the end here, it should just put us um, back in the default position, the default location. There we go. It worked. Cool. Um, yeah, so that's just a very basic platform game. We just get to the end and then rip one, basically. Um, yeah, are there any questions so far about any of that? Or anything you want me to show you kind of right now? There's a little bit of time left. No, 
no hand shooting up, so I think that was probably fine. Um, if you have any questions or want me to show you anything else, then just kind of let me know. I can show you either now or on Discord later. But if no one has any pressing questions, then we can probably end this portion of the session there. Feel free to stay around because the rest of the workshop does exist. We kind of stay around until six, unless everyone leaves. Um, and then we can just kind of work on games if you want. Um, I think I'll probably end up that one. Uh, thanks for listening. <laughs>